This programme was made with support from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Fillet of a fenny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. I have mute and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Alice fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and harrow's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. On the Heritage Channel tonight, the origins of some familiar Christmas traditions, a fishy feature film, and the magic of witchcraft. Welcome to the Heritage Channel on Clee TV, where we explore the fascinating history of North East Lincolnshire in a monthly roundup of news, views and other stories. Is witchcraft still practised today? And if so, do modern day witches bear any resemblance to the frightening hags portrayed in Shakespeare's Scottish play? I took a spell away from the studio to catch up with the witches of West Street our very own contemporary coven here in the heart of Lincolnshire. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, cool it with a baboon's blood, then the charm is firm and good. I was expecting broomsticks and boiling cauldrons and chilly hats. <laughs> no, that's, that. that's all in the kitchen. <laughs> You've got me in the front room. <laughs> It's a massive sweeping movement at the moment. Um, since COVID, we've had so many people say that their spiritual journey has really begun. They've understood the, the meaning of being here and, and spirituality and witchcraft really plays a part in that. So going right back to its roots where it was basically medicine women in the countryside that could do really fantastic things with herbs and understood herbs to, to manifesting what you want and to realizing that the power that you hold is not some external god but yourself and um, people are really understanding that and that's what witchcraft is truly about it's harnessing what you hold and using it for the greater good although christmas is a is a basically christian festival um yuletide uh, there are also some pagan things around yuletide can you tell me a little bit about those Absolutely. Well, midwinter is, is a pagan festival. So the pagan calendar runs as an agricultural calendar. So midwinter for us is a, a feasting rite. It's where we batten down for the winter. We bring the greenery in from the outside to make the house look pretty because it's quite bleak outside. So this is where evergreens become really important because for us, it's it's making the world a brighter place for the berries, you know, the rich berries and and all the stuff we've dried during the um, during the summer times like oranges and lemons so we're celebrating the end of a, of a lovely agricultural year and and the earth is now insulating ready for its next um, its next phase so what are some of the things that uh, that we perhaps do now that are, originate from pagan traditions lots of things that we do so the yule log that that's a tradition that was brought in so you'd bring um you'd bring in a, a log a literally not, not a chocolate one but a log from, from outside to burn in your hearth. And basically it brought prosperity for the new year. St Nick, well, he was allegedly, this is mythological obviously, but Odin running through the skies with his eight-legged horse, giving out presents to the needy and the poor. Christmas trees, again, another thing, bringing the outside into the house. Many different um, variations on the Christmas tree story, but it's obviously it's a Norse pagan tradition. And the mistletoe, which has a really horrible dark past. It was thought that it's the tears of Frigg, who was um, the mother of Baldur, who became known for his in invincibility until Loki turned uh, a, we a weapon out of mistletoe and killed him. Mistletoe berries are his mother's tears. So I think there's a few things there that we have accepted as Christmas traditions, where they really do have deep-seated pagan roots and Norse roots. So, uh, Shelley, tell me a little bit about the relevance of 
witchcraft today? Do you still cast spells? Yes, we do cast spells. Of course we do. But we cast them for health, luck, love, prosperity, for, for successful business. You know, anything basically that's for the greater good. And it's about understanding the power that you have. We're at a time in the world where there's lots of difficulties and challenges and troubles. So have you got a spell that you can cast for us for the new year to make life a little bit better and absolutely, easier? Absolutely, absolutely. All we need to do is manifest positivity and that can be done so easily. And it's literally just hoping and wishing for everybody to have peace and happiness. If we all just thought happy thoughts, good thoughts, and put positivity out to people, that enough would be enough to make a massive worldwide spell to spread that positivity everywhere. And that's all we want is positivity and happiness for everybody. To find out more about modern day witchcraft, call into Frange and Prong or look out for their fascinating talks on Heritage Lincolnshire's online events. Other events coming to Heritage Lincolnshire in the new year include Finding the Real Richard III on the 17th and Catherine of Aragon, the Spanish Princess, on the 18th. Full details of all events from the Heritage Lincolnshire website. A new feature film from director Jack Spring, whose family are from Grimsby, uses the heritage of the local fishing industry as a setting for his comedy heist, Three Day Millionaire. Hugh Richards and John Williamson went along to the world premiere at the Parkway Cinema to meet the cast and crew. Three Day Millionaire, the tale of three fishermen who turned to crime to save their community, has turned Cleethorpe's Parkway Cinema, at least for one night, into Leicester Square. The 26-year-old director made his first feature in his father's hometown, nostalgic for Grimsby's fishing past, but optimistic about its future. You know, so it's kind of perfect timing you know, for a film about Grimsby shedding its old, not shedding its old identity, but not holding on to it to its detriment like it perhaps has been and you know but in converting that to celebrating it and loving it but you know being very aware that them times have kind of gone and you know they should be celebrated but there's now something new and you know we should grasp to that. Grimbarians will recognize every street and most pubs but this is not documentary it's a comedy drama think Guy Ritchie, Adam Bleasdale, even George Clooney. Fishermen we are oceans for we definitely are not. He's probably doing this with some big idea of how to save Grimsby. OK, listen up. We have to get through three layers of security. The stars enjoyed researching their roles, discovering their own characters and the character of a characteristic community. What happened was, as I said to Jack, it's quite important for me to get up here quite early doors and meet the local people, you know. Uh, and it was quite important to me because, it, you know, they're real, real characters, these guys. And to, to meet the trawlers, the ex-trawlers, hear the stories of what they went through, you know, and stuff like that, it was really important for me to get into that, into that zone kind of thing. Films about millionaires need money, but this had no studio system, just local support. You know, every single penny was raised in Grimsby, you know, from, from individuals or corporate sponsors, um, you know, so... It is literally as Grimsby as it gets, you know, the fire was financed here, it's written about here, it's all shot here, you know, we engaged so much of the town and we spent an awful lot of money, you know, into the economy and, um, yeah, I don't think there'll ever be a more kind of Grimsby identity film. The fishing industry might really be dead and gone, but from the audience reaction here in Cleethorpes, Grimsby might be turning into Hollywood on the Humber. A lot of the docks area it all looks very similar. It's got that kind of red, kind of ex-industrial, you know, red brick kind of feel. And as a filmmaker, that's great because you want consistency in a place. And you know, you go down the Casbah on the docks, it's like going to the Universal. It's like a pre-built film set. So it's absolutely amazing. And you know, the people here have been great. They've welcomed us with open arms. You know, particularly after the previous Grimsby film. You know, there must have been a bit of kind of hesitation that another person with a southern accent is coming up here and doing a film, and you know, is going to kind of paint the town in slander. But you know. Hopefully we've done the complete opposite of that and you know, a big part of what we're doing is trying to change Grimsby's perception on a kind of national and international stage. The cast and crew clearly wouldn't mind coming back. As locations go, it's better than a back lot in California. Yes, I love Grimsby. I, I, you know, Grimsby, I don't know, it had, 
bad name. And we loved it. We loved the people. The people are absolutely amazing. They're so friendly, so welcoming. They come through enough for us. And I don't know. We, we just love the place. We think it's wonderful. And we've even talked about coming back here for like maybe a little get together or something. It's, it's just a lovely place. Clean Thought's lovely as well, which is where we are right now. Working in the care sector is really rewarding for people who enjoy working with others and enjoy helping people. To bring a smile to somebody's face, to offer to go shopping for somebody who can't do it themselves, that's what's rewarding. It's difficult to actually describe how I feel. Uh, proud because I changing not just my life but a client and the loved ones, the families around them as well. You know, your job's very rewarding to know that you've you've helped someone or, you, or you've saved someone's life. I think it's, it's little things. You are making a difference, however small it is. Our place, our planet, a magical evening of poetry and music from the Culture House celebrated the rich heritage of our coastal community. Performing under Luke Jerram's Gaia at Grimsby Minster, local poets and musicians celebrated both the beauty and fragility of our planet, how it nourishes and inspires us, and how we are in danger of destroying the very thing that sustains our existence. <laughs> Who cares? Not always a mother supporting life. She was once an adolescent, all heat and anger. Faceful. Trees are beautiful, generous and wise. Their systems developed over millennia have evolved to sustain all life forms. They Inhale the oxygen in one smooth slide through nose and throat Windpipe long. What happened to the sky? That's where those aircraft overfly. What happened to the Avon? A good provider finding, feeding, nurturing life, not creating it, always giving, but he could never say she was caring. It's a river, it flows from Mother Earth. This drug. with leaves, apple tree to Amazon. Inhale at one with plankton, ocean swell to ocean swell to sea salt air. In and let the current take it, laying on its side, to be swept out to the ocean, a floating piece of wood, floating by a crowd of its own. Nature is the wilderness we long to return to where we can witness the miracle that is our home, planet Earth. Christmas crackers, turkey and Boxing Day are just some of the Christmas traditions we come to take for granted. But how and when did they start? Gemma Lingard has been discovering their origins. There are lots of traditions associated with Christmas, like eating turkey, pulling crackers and going to the panto. But have you ever wondered how these traditions began? Boxing Day, when we often visit relatives, is generally thought to have been created as a holiday for tradesmen to receive a boxing or gift the day after Christmas. Putting a silver coin in the Christmas pudding is said to bring luck to the person who finds it. This tradition is thought to have been originated in the courts of King Edward II, where a bean or dried pea would be placed inside the pudding, and whoever got a slice with it in would be crowned king or queen for the day. Turkeys were first brought to Britain in the 16th century, and we began to eat turkey during Christmas dinner, as farmers would be in need of their cattle for milk and their chickens to lay eggs. Geese, boar and even peacocks were other Christmas delicacies. While giving presents is a normal part of Christmas celebrations around the world, very few countries actually gave and received gifts on the 25th of December. In many other European countries, gifts are exchanged on the 24th. 
and in Spanish-speaking countries after Christmas. The United Kingdom is one of the few countries where gifts are opened on Christmas Day itself. Crackers were first created in the mid-19th century by a sweet maker called Tom Smith, who tried selling sweets around Christmas time with a small motto or riddle included in the packaging. Later, he decided to add the crackle elements after seeing logs crackle on a fire. The Queen's Christmas message is now watched on television by millions of people every year. And that tradition began in 1932, when King George V gave his first radio broadcast on the BBC's Empire Service, and has continued ever since. I wish you all, my dear friends, a happy Christmas. I've been deeply touched by the greetings which in the last few minutes have reached me. Pantomime has its roots in Commedia dell'arte, a 16th century Italian entertainment which used dance, music, tumbling, acrobats and featured a cast of mischievous stock characters. These included Harlequin Scaramouche and Pantaloon. And by the early 18th century, these comedia characters began to appear on the London stage in early pantomimes, which were based on classical stories set to music but without speech. The tradition of the pantomime dame we know today began in 1806, when Samuel Simmons created Mother Goose. Oh yes he did! Music historian and folk singer Kirsty Hanna has been exploring some of the English folk songs that originate here in Lincolnshire for her new album released this month. Once I had a sprig of time It prospered by night and by day so it's my debut EP, um, it's called On the Humber Banks and it's an EP of four Lincolnshire folk songs. So they're all songs that were collected by Percy Granger in the early 1900s from Lincolnshire singers. There's a wealth of songs to choose from from Lincolnshire and it's just a very small selection of my favourites. Uh, so the first song is called Sprig of Time uh, and it's a song that was collected from folk singer Joseph Taylor. It's quite a well-known song, and it's one of the first Lincolnshire folk songs that I ever learnt. I've had a strange sort of relationship with it over the years. Sometimes I've, I've really enjoyed singing it, and other times I haven't. But now it just seems to really resonate with me more than it, it ever has. Let's see what is my name. I've brought my... Uh, so the second song is a song called Betsy Walton, and the title of the EP on the Humber Banks actually comes from that song. It was collected from a singer called Brian Cooper and in the manuscript it's quite a short song and there were parts of it that didn't quite fit for me so I wanted to explore that further. It's a song that I'd been interested in for quite a while and I thought there's really something here, I want to do something with this. Uh, so I went to look for the broadside and there's a broadside called The Effects of Love. So. I took parts from that, added it in, changed some things around and gave the song a new tune uh, and Betsy Walton on the EP is the result of that. Early one spring, early one spring, I went on board to serve the... Uh, so the third song is called Early One Spring. Uh, it's a jaunty little song really, it's not a very long song, um, but I was just quite drawn to the story. There were some extra verses for it on the manuscript, um, but I think how it is, it, it kind of leaves a bit of an untold ending, um, and I quite like that. I like to think what happened afterwards, you know. And a man goes off to fight for the king on the ship, leaving his true love behind, as often happens in folk songs. Um, he writes to her and doesn't hear anything, um, comes back and she's married to somebody else. One evening clear down by a river side. Um, so the final song, it's a song called Riley. It was collected in Lincolnshire from a singer called George Orton. Uh, it's a song that's known in many different forms. There's lots of different versions. There's versions from Ireland. Uh, so this is a song that I learned from, from the singing of George Orton. So you can listen 
to a lot of the Lincolnshire singers on phonograph recordings that were made by Percy Granger. Uh, and you can listen to those on the, the Sound Library website. So it, it's really nice to have those. We've got such a wealth of, of songs. It, it's a great history of folk music in Lincolnshire. And it's a history that I think, unless you're really interested in that, that area, folk music, folk song, it's not something that, that a lot of people know about. But when you start talking to people about it, they actually, they do find it really interesting. So I think it's just to sort of bring a bit more attention to that and, and share the history, share some of the songs, and maybe that'll inspire other people to do their own research. My mind has never been a the latest in the Paint the Town Proud project, a Grimsby Creates collaboration between Creative Starts and the Culture House, was unveiled this month by the Mayor of Grimsby, Steve Besant. Part of a series of public artworks that celebrate the heritage of the town and its people, this giant mural is thought to be the largest in Lincolnshire. Alex Thompson was there to capture the event for the Heritage Channel. Well, when Sam showed me the wall, I was taken aback to how large it was, you know. I've never done a mural before, so it's a baptism of fire. Yeah, pretty proud of this one. The thing that I'm really proud of is, uh, is Dale, really, working with Dale Mackey. He's an artist I've always admired. To be able to work with him on something so large as this, he's a real honour for me. It's called, obviously called the Great Wall of Grimsby. It's got a bit of everything in it. I, I say it's like a feast for the eyes. It's a legacy, it is, of what we destroyed in the 60s, some of the marvellous buildings, etc. And I'm amazed, I'm, I'm amazed. Somebody rang me, I think it was my eldest son, and he comes and says, Dad, you must come and see the mural. It's got, uh, it's got your, some of your boxes on there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, when I come in there, it's incredible. I cannot remember ever seeing anything like this in Grimsby. My dad passed away in August and they said there was a memento to, uh, to him. They put a picture of dad upon the wall, on the wall as well. But then a few weeks ago they said we've had a bit of a talk and a vote. And we've all decided we're going to put you on as well if you don't mind. We've had lots of help there. We've had the Creative Start volunteers. Um, we've had people, one or two from the public, putting a bit of painting a brick or two. The, the youngsters have been involved and everybody else. Everybody feels connected then. They feel connected to the wall. Well, it must be the biggest mural in Lincolnshire, for the very least. They've been using fairly big brushes and they've been using little fine art brushes to get the final detail they have, the finite detail. And that is incredible. The thing that's important to me is the recovery element of what we do and in, in, engaging people in arts and culture that never would have thought that they would be involved. So that for me is really what is I'm most proud of always. The whole of the borough should be proud of the work which has been carried out by the artists. Absolutely incredible. Well that's all from the Heritage Channel for this year. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you in January for more Heritage news, views and stories including how you will benefit from a heritage building recently acquired by the local community organisation, Our Big Picture. If you're watching on Facebook, don't forget to join our group or on YouTube, click the subscribe button below to make sure you don't miss any of our programmes. From Alex, Ellis, Gemma, Hugh, John, Kirsty and all the team at the Heritage Channel, have a wonderful Christmas and we'll see you again in January. Programs on the Heritage Channel are made with support from the National Lottery Heritage Fund.